So, I mean, this is a traditional still life cup saucer material. The key to it was to be able to get three different materials. Silk, burlap, felt, anything like that, velvet, anything. Um, it's hard to create fabric. And people go, well, how do you paint fabric? I go, what kind of fabric? If we were back in the olden days in college, back in the you know, 18th century, before the Impressionists were, you were in the academy. First, you wouldn't be there because women were not allowed there. And the first year, they would spend doing nothing but fabric. Mm -hmm. And when you think about all those old paintings, what do you think of? Fabrics. These guys became master fabric painters. Mm -hmm. And because there was so much drapery and so much, you know, bronze and all this stuff, they had to concentrate on all these different materials. So one of my students said, hey, let's exercise fabric. And I said, oh, you're going to be sorry you request that. <laughs> so what I'm looking for is, regardless of if it's a teacup or anything, I'm looking to see, so what is the fabrics that you used in this? And so regardless of whether or not I have an opinion on it, your classmates have said, Mm, it doesn't quite look like silk. How do you paint silk? And I go, I don't know. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah. But the curiosity of going how, you know, when you look at Sargent's painting and you look from across the room and you go, oh my God, look at that silk. Never has there been a more beautiful silk dress. And you walk up to it and you see these big bowls slapping and you go, huh? <laughs> And you get back with it and you go, how does that, e whoa. And the only way you can do it is to practice it. I guarantee you, Sargent worked on a lot of silk. Sargent was one of these artists that was so consumed with getting it, getting an effect, that when he painted satin, he just didn't paint satin. He painted satin in its glorious way. If these rich ladies wore satin, it was expensive satin. Satin imported from Japan, something that, you know, was so rare. And he would drape these women in this stuff. And he wanted people around the world to know that. They wanted to know that. One reason why he got so many commissions is because he would drape his models in the finest of fine. But so he sat there and he looked at satin and went, what does it look like? You know, he didn't have a teacher at that point. He was all by himself. And there's the model. So what does it look like? What does velvet look like? How do I put satin and velvet together? Those are the questions. Not only just on top of everything else. Look at how complicated everything is in, in painting. How do you make it into a composition and, you know, put a spoon in it? I don't know. In a, in a, in a satin dress from Sargent, what do you think the... What do you think the center focal point would be? The, the highlight on the, not the breast. <laughs> no, it would be the highlight on the satin, you know? You know, it would be the highlight on the satin, how the light hit that, or the velvet, or the intensity of color. Nice. The, the thing that's distracting is a lot of this complicated lace, because of all of the lights and darks, there's a lot of hard edges in there, so it dra drags us down. It's really hard to get that center focal point with when, when you look at that, this would naturally go out of focus. Just the way that we see things. Hmm? That's all you see, but see her center focal point. So, so the thing is though, but she has, she's done, she's done great composition and she's brought, look at these eye magnets. People go, what is an eye magnet? And I go, those are lines that lead you to a surprise. You know, they lead you around the painting. So we have these wonderful lines leading us to here. Even these arches coming down bring, bring us to there. So your eye magnet and then the cup being slightly over. Um, what an absolute wonderful foundation for a painting. Absolutely great. The crunchy wool, she said. The crunchy wool. And we have this, uh, this looks like kind of like a, a laced. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful start. It's really great. Very traditional, really worthy of, of painting. Well, this one we have lights and shadows, which is awesome. What I wanted to say about this, in the process of doing her fabric, 
notice she started picking up some interesting pattern. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is she started playing with that brush stroke. Well, regardless of what it, what it is, it, it started inspiring her to put paint on in that way. And you see this kind of going across and I almost see it starting to happen even in the background and all of a sudden I'm very interested to see how she painted it. It's like the painting of it is fascinating me. And so you've taken, you've taken me from just a cup and saucer or even fabric and you have wowed me with how you put paint on the canvas a different way. You know, it's like all of a sudden she's filling around with a different way of painting. And the act of painting becomes more interesting than the subject matter itself. It's like, like a really raw, raw, um, really raw idea that she could probably develop into a unique style. I mean, you just never know. You never know. It's like Rada's painting. She's starting new. And I said, this might be the beginning of a new way of you painting forever. But if you keep on painting the same way all the time, you will always just paint that same way. The homework assignments are an opportunity for you to paint differently, to paint out of your comfort zone, try something different. If you're not trying every time you go home saying, I was inspired by Jean's painting, I was inspired by, uh, you know, Darla's painting, I was inspired by whatever, you know, whatever that is. Bring it in, try it. You're not going to, nobody's going to come and swoop down on you. So whose is this? So what were you thinking? <coughs> As she sighs. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's, uh, let's hear. She doesn't talk very loud. What did you say? Well, don't fall bad about it because a lot of people contact me and they go, what do you mean painting an effect over a thing? How can you like paint a thing without having, you know, and the thing is it's the effect. So that's it. When I'm looking at this, I do see things. I see a silver spoon. I see a thing, uh, a cup. I see a saucer here. You have all of these materials here. Um, and so, yeah, there are a, a bunch of things. So what I go is, where's your central focal point? Okay, well, she has to defend her, her yeah, view, not right. everybody else jump in. Because she'll just agree with all of you so that she gets <laughs> off the hot plate. No talking. Shh. Okay, so where's the central focal point? Plate. Okay, so a plate is a thing. That's not what we're after. Okay. So, but the thing is, what would, is, what's an effect? The, the thing that is awesome, though, is look at the possibility of having the shadow of the spoon across the plates. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's creating an effect. That can actually hold a painting together. Yes, we see fine china and, you know, that's not that interesting. What's interesting is something happening and a shadow going across the plate is in, more interesting than a spoon or a plate itself. So if you would have said, I love the light hitting the spoon and the shadow it causes, that's, that's when make a painting. So you said you had to make it up. That's good. I don't care if you make it up. It's better if you set it up to do that. And it's kind of difficult to do that. It's difficult. You have to have right lighting and stuff. But the ultimate still life painter would actually make sure that they could set it up to get that. But something else has to happen to make it more interesting than the objects themselves. And that shadow going across the plate and the spoon is more of a possibility than just the items themselves. So you actually nailed it. Okay. Well, this one we have lights and shadows, which is awesome. What I wanted to say about this, in the process of doing her fabric, notice she started picking up some interesting pattern. And what's interesting is she started playing with that brush stroke, well, regardless of what it, what it is. 
it, it started inspiring her to put paint on in that way. And you see this kind of going across and I almost see it starting to happen even in the background. And all of a sudden I'm very interested to see how she painted it. It's like the painting of it is fascinating me. And so you've taken, you've taken me from just a cup and saucer or even fabric and you have wowed me with how you put paint on the canvas a different way. You know, it's like all of a sudden she's filling around with a different way of painting. And the act of painting becomes more interesting than the subject matter itself. It's like, like a really raw, raw, um, really raw idea that she could probably develop into a unique style. I mean, you just never know. You never know. It's like Rado's painting, she's starting new. And I said, this might be the beginning of a new way of you painting forever. But if you keep on painting the same way all the time, you will always just paint that same way. The homework assignments are an opportunity for you to paint differently, to paint out of your comfort zone, try something different. If you're not trying every time you go home saying, I was inspired by Jean's painting, I was inspired by uh, Darla's painting, I was inspired by whatever, you know, whatever that is, bring it in, try it. You're not going to, nobody's going to come and swoop down on you.